there's the chance of the system taking control. And for some reasons, I'm I'm less concerned about that. I'm glad other people are. The one that that sort of befuddles me is human purpose. When the machine says to me, Bill, go play pickleball. I've got malaria eradication. You're just a slow thinker. Then, you know, it is a philosophically confusing thing and how you organize society. Yes, we're going to improve education, but education to do what? There's a lot of psychologically difficult parts of working on the technology, but this is the, for me, the most difficult. Because I also yeah, like, you're, you're get a lot real of satisfaction <laughs> from that. And it's like, in some real sense, this might be like the last hard thing I ever do. Well, our, our minds are so organized around scarcity, scarcity of teachers and yeah. doctors and good ideas. I do wonder if a generation that grows up without that scarcity will find the philosophical notion of how to organize society and what to do. Maybe they'll come up with a solution. And I, I'm afraid my mind is so shaped around scarcity, I, I even have a hard time thinking of it. If we can get into this world of post-scarcity, we will find new things to do. They'll feel very different. But I think the only way out is through. We just have to go do this thing. It's going to happen. This is like now an unstoppable technological course. The value is too great. And I'm pretty confident, very confident we'll make it work. But it does feel like it's going to all be so different. Yeah, I think if it comes across as asking for a slowdown, that'll be really hard. If it is instead says, OK, do what you want. But any compute cluster above a certain extremely high power threshold, and given the cost here, we're talking maybe five in the world, something like that, any cluster like that has got to submit to the equivalent of international weapons inspectors. And the model there has to be made available for safety audit, pass some tests during training and before deployment. That feels possible to me. I wasn't that sure before, but I did a big trip around the world this year, talked to heads of state in many of the countries that would need to participate in this. And there was like almost universal support for it. Right now, I guess the we're looking at a lot of productivity improvement from AI, which you know, that's overwhelmingly a very good thing. Which areas are you most excited about? Yeah. So first of all, I always think it's worth remembering that we're just sort of on this long, continuous curve. Um, so like right now we have, an, we have AI systems that can do tasks. They certainly can't do jobs, but they can do tasks and there's productivity gain there. Eventually they'll be able to do more things that we think of like a job today. Um, and we'll, of course, find new jobs and better jobs. And I totally believe that if you give people way more powerful tools. It's not just they can work a little faster, they can do qualitatively different things. And so, you know, right now, maybe we can speed up a program or 3x. It's about what we see. I mean, that's one of the categories that we're most excited about. It's it working super well. But if you make a programmer three times more effective, it's not just that they can write, they can do three times more stuff. It's that they can, at that high level of abstraction, using more of their brain power, they can now think of totally different things. And it's like, you know, going from punch cards, to higher level languages didn't just let us program a little faster. It let us do these qualitatively new things. But I think it's worth always putting it in context of this technology that at least for the next five or 10 years will be on a very steep improvement curve. Um, these are the stupidest the models will ever be. But Coding is probably the area, the single area from a productivity gain we're most excited about today. Healthcare and education are two things that are coming up that curve that we're very excited about too. So how do you see robotics? Super excited for that. We started robots too early. Um, and so we had to put that project on hold. It was hard for the wrong reasons. It wasn't helping us make progress with the difficult parts of the ML research. And, you know, we were like dealing with bad simulators and breaking tendons and things like that. And also we realized more and more over time that what we really first needed was intelligence and cognition. And then we could figure out how to adapt it to physicality. And it was easier to start with that with the way we've built these language models. But we have always planned to come back to it. We've started investing a little bit in robotics companies. I think on the physical hardware side, there's finally, for the first time that I've ever seen, really exciting new platforms being built there. And at some point, we will be able to use our models, as you were saying, with their language understanding and future video understanding to say, all right, like, let's do amazing things with a, with a robot. And what about the competition? Is that kind of a fun thing that, you know, many people are working on this all at once? It's, you know, both like annoying and motivating <laughs> and fun. I'm sure you felt similarly, but it does push us to be better and do faster. And we're very confident in our approach. We have like a lot of people that I think are like skating to where the puck was and we're going to where the puck is going and it feels all right. Bill Gates interviews Sam Altman on Bill's podcast called Unconfuse Me, which was apparently on YouTube this whole time. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty general. They don't go too deep into anything, but it is an interesting thing to watch those two kind of discuss where they think AGI, AI, where the world is going and how AI will affect it. But one thing that really caught my attention didn't happen at that interview 
but it sounds like it was happening while that interview was being released. So this is kickoff for YC, Y Combinator, where they get a lot of the founders of these startups. It sounds like it took place at OpenAI's headquarters in San Francisco. Sam Altman was there. Now, for the life of me, I can't find any video of this. I can barely find any images. But in his sort of initial speech to the new founders, to these tech founders that are all building their own companies, Sam Altman suggested people build with the mindset that GPT-5 and AGI will be achieved relatively soon, that most GPT-4 limitations will get fixed in GPT-5. Here are some key takeaways. One, startups need contextual optimization more than behavior optimization. Providing more information via RAG, etc., can be more beneficial than fine tuning. Two, OpenAI API will continue to be faster, more reliable, and cheaper. However, there will always be a balance between performance and cost. For example, iPhone will keep its one, one and a half day battery life to optimize for performance, even though battery technology has improved significantly. And three, it's not advisable to build companies that focus primarily on addressing current GPT-4 limitations. Most limitations will get partially slash entirely fixed in GPT-5. This was published in the standard a few days earlier, ChatGPT-5 release date, what we know about OpenAI's next chatbot. In recent months, hype has been building around a new and more powerful version of the tech that underpins ChatGPT, a language model that will be dubbed GPT-5. Altman allegedly spoke about GPT-5 and GPT-6 during a talk at his former venture capital firm Y Combinator at the alumni reunion in September, according to two people who attended the event. He said that both the AI models were in the bag. There's not too many more details about when it's going to be available, so we'll see. Are we going to see GPT-4.5? Are we going to see GPT-5? We have yet to see. In other news, there's this. Apparently, someone found the kryptonite to ChatGPT. Apparently, if you upload this image to ChatGPT and ask it, what do you see, or something to that effect, it just breaks. Why? Who knows? A lot of people are reporting being able to break ChatGPT with that, with that image. I don't know why. In other news, Sam Altman got married. But yes, it's true. Sam Altman did say AI do. Like, I do. AI do. I don't know. It's really late right now. Either way, congratulations to him. That's it for me for today. Here's Andre Karpathy explaining the meaning of life. Enjoy. It is really interesting to think about like what the puzzle of the universe is. Did the creator of the universe uh, give us a message? Like for example, in the book Contact, um, Carl Sagan, uh, there's a message for humanity, for any civilization in the uh, digits, in the expansion of pi in base 11 eventually, which is kind of an interesting thought. Uh, maybe, maybe we're supposed to be giving a message to our creator. Maybe we're supposed to somehow create some kind of a quantum mechanical system that alerts them to our intelligent presence here. Because if you think about it from their perspective, it's just say like quantum field theory, massive like cellular automaton like thing. And like, how do you even notice that we exist? You might not even be able to pick us up in that simulation. And so how do you, uh, how do you prove that you exist, that you're intelligent and that you're part of the universe? 